Hi, and welcome to this episode of John's Model Kit Review. In today's fun classic model kit review, we'll be taking a look at the Revell Monogram Messerschmitt BF 110 G2 in 148 scale. This is Revell kit number 4164. This kit was initially released in 1994, and my particular boxing is the 1999 boxing. In this video, I'll give a brief history of the Messerschmitt BF 110. We'll also go through the kit instructions and talk about any problem areas to watch out for during construction. We'll talk about the fit of the major parts of the aircraft. We'll also talk about the surface detailing on the exterior of the plane. We'll look at the clear parts that are included and we'll talk about the fit and clarity of those. We'll also talk about any optional clear parts. We'll look at the detailing on the smaller parts that are included with this kit, including the landing gear and the interior bits and I'll talk about any aftermarket parts that I used during this build. We'll take a look at the color and marking guides and talk about the decals and the quality and performance of those. And as we go through this review, we'll be comparing this kit to the newer Edouard BF110G kits. There are definitely areas where this kit has some advantages over the Edouard kit, and there are some areas where the Edouard kit has advantages over this kit. Looking at the history of the Messerschmitt BF-110, when the BF-110 was unveiled by the Luftwaffe in the late 1930s, it was heralded as an invincible war machine. So powerful, heavily armed, and nimble, the twin-engine fighter was classed as a Zerstorer, or destroyer. The BF-110 was intended to break the back of the stubborn British RAF. Reichsmarschall Goring proclaimed the Zerstorer squadrons the Luftwaffe's elite fighter groups. Once in action against the British Spitfires and Hurricanes, however, the big Messerschmitt fighters proved too clumsy and unable to defend themselves, let alone the bombers they were assigned to protect. This was not an inherent problem with the BF-110. It was simply the wrong airplane for the fighter escort role. Development of the BF-110 progressed along the lines indicated by the failures and successes encountered during operations with the fighter. The BF-110G series featured improved armament and more powerful engines. These, along with new tactics, now gave the Luftwaffe a formidable weapon, which ultimately led to a very effective night fighter. The G-2 was developed for the dual roles of Zerstorer and fighter-bomber. Its size and weight allowed the use of heavy weapons such as cannon or rockets, along with bombs. These planes began to reach the Luftwaffe in May of 1942. Some of the most colorful markings applied to the German aircraft appeared on the BF-110. Looking at the kit instructions, step one is a four-part step, and it is focused on the cockpit assembly. Most of the time spent on this step will be in detail painting the cockpit parts. I really like the way Ravel got a lot of detail crammed into this cockpit with a minimal usage of parts. Looking through the kit transparencies, the only addition I would recommend making to the interior of this kit is an addition of aftermarket seatbelts. I've used a set of the Edouard Luftwaffe seatbelts, and those really dress up what can be seen through the cockpit canopy. Even the sidewall detail on this kit is very nice and looks very good through the cockpit transparencies. In step two, we're closing up the fuselage halves around the interior, and we're adding the resin nose cone. I was able to get a very good fit on the resin nose of this aircraft. I used white glue to attach it. I had no issues there. I left the resin cannon barrels off until final assembly, and I attached those with white glue at that time. You can see the fit on the underside of the nose. I was able to get a filler-free join here as well. If we look at the fuselage seam on the spine of the aircraft, that turned out great as well. On several of the Messerschmitt fighters, there's actually a seam that runs down the top of the spine, so you don't want to fill that on this kit. In step three, we are building the engine nacelles, and then we are installing those onto the wings of the aircraft. I like the engineering of these parts. These parts went together very well. The completed nacelle assemblies fit very nicely onto the wing assemblies, and I didn't have any major problems with this area. One thing to note is that the top of the nacelles in the Revell kit are somewhat flatter on top 
than they are on the Edouard kit. I think that's an area where the Edouard kit has an advantage over this one shape-wise. In step four, we're completing the wing assemblies and then we're attaching the wing assemblies to the fuselage. This is done a little bit uniquely on this kit and I like the engineering of this area as well. Looking at the seam between the wing and the fuselage, I was able to get a very good join between the upper wings and the fuselage halves. And I was also able to get a very good join between the lower wings and the fuselage halves. I had no problems in this area of construction. Step five covers the tail assembly. These parts built up quickly. I was able to get a filler free join between the parts themselves and between the tail and the fuselage. In step six, we're building the main landing gear and we're attaching that and the gear doors to the kit. I thought the detailing on these parts was excellent. I think these look great on the finished kit. And even the wheel well detail turned out very nicely once it was painted and weathered a little bit. Step seven covers the radiator assemblies as they mount to the undersides of the wings. This was the only step of construction where I had any issues. And the issue that I had was that the splitter on the intake side of the radiators did not go all the way to the wing surface. So I added a piece of plastic strip to extend the splitter all the way to the wing surface. In step eight, we're installing the intakes and the exhaust to the kit. I didn't have any problem in this step of construction and I think these parts look very nice on the finished kit. In step nine, we're building the underwing external fuel tanks. These assembled very easily. They installed easily on the aircraft and I think the detailing on these is very good. In step 10, we're adding more of the detail parts to the underside of the aircraft. I think the detail on these parts was sufficient for the scale and I think these look nice on the finished kit. In step 11, we're building the main wheel assemblies. I really like the detail on these and I like the fact that Revell provides weighted tires, so that really improves the look of the kit on the shelf. In step 12, we're adding the rearward facing machine guns. I drilled out the machine gun barrels prior to installation and I think these look fine on the finished kit. In step 13, we're adding the canopy parts to the airframe. There are optional parts for the forward section of the cockpit that allow you to pose the pilot's canopy either open or closed. I used the parts that would allow me to open the canopy if I so desire, and I was still able to model these closed up without any issues. Step 14 covers the propeller assemblies. These went fine. I didn't have any issues with this step of construction. In step 15, we're just adding the wingtips to the aircraft and the pitot tube. Once again, these parts look great on the finished kit. Looking at the color and marking guide, there are two marking options included for this kit. The first one is for a Messerschmitt BF-110G2 that was stationed in Italy in 1943. The second aircraft is a BF-110G2 stationed in Russia in 1943. There's also a page in the instruction that covers the common stencils that appear on both aircraft in this kit. I chose the first marking option and the decals for this kit went down very nicely over a gloss coat. The most challenging aspect of the decals was the wasp on the nose of the BF-110. I had to cut the wasp decals in several places to get them to settle over the detail on the nose. Looking at the surface detailing on the exterior of the kit, most of it is represented by very fine engraved panel lines. There are also some engraved rivets. And on my kit, I've actually gone back and added in some underlying structural detail and rivet lines with pastels. If you're not familiar with that technique, I have a video on how to do that. And you can click the link above to see how I add detail to a more basic kit. In conclusion, well, I'm very happy with the way that this kit turned out. I think Ravel has done an excellent job of creating a very nicely detailed model kit without resorting to an inordinately high parts count. The only aftermarket addition that I made to this kit was the addition of the Edouard pre-painted photo etch seat belts. 
I would also recommend a set of Edouard canopy masks for this aircraft. I think it'll save you a lot of time during the build process. It's true that the engine nacelles on this kit aren't quite as accurate as the engine nacelles that are on the Edouard kit. It's also true that the amount of engraved detail on the surface of this kit is somewhat simplified when compared to the engraved detailing that's found on the Edouard kit. If you're the kind of builder that only builds the latest and greatest model kits, I highly suggest getting one of the Edouard Profipack BF110Gs. I think those are a great value for the money with all of the extras that are included. Because of the complexity of the paint scheme on this aircraft and the complexity of building a twin engine fighter and the additional complexity of adding a resin nose to the aircraft, I can recommend this kit to more experienced modelers who are looking to put a well-detailed, easy building, very nice looking Messerschmitt BF110 model on the shelf. Well, I'd love to know what you guys think. If any of you out there have built the Ravel Monogram BF110 G2, please feel free to comment in the comment section below. As always, I hope you found this video entertaining and informative, and until next time, model on.